We have just finished together a series on the faces of Jesus, looking at different, perhaps, aspects or facets of Jesus' ministry. And before we begin a series on the limits of forgiveness, next Sunday we find ourselves in between, celebrating, along with many churches across the globe, uh, the day of Pentecost. And so, as Reverend Kelly would teach our children in worship and wonder, and as the church tells time, sometimes we tell time visually, and so we switch our colors to colors of sort of the symbolism of the flame. As you entered the sanctuary space this morning, a tongue of fire may have alighted upon your forehead. Uh, Not a birthday streamer, but a tongue of fire. And so you have already experienced in some small way uh, the flames of Pentecost this morning. But today we'll hear not from perhaps those familiar words in the book of Acts, but instead in John's gospel, the 14th chapter beginning in verse 12. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. Would you pray with me? And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of each heart, be found acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who among you gathered in this space this morning can name the greatest television show of all time. Don't mess this up, church. I see you telling your neighbor, you tell me. What was it? MASH. I'm too young for MASH, Lauren. I've never seen MASH. Good attempt. Someone else? Friends, popular sitcom, not the best ever. Laugh in. That's. <laughs> I've not heard of that one either. What else? Jeopardy. Very. Is that guy still winning? No, he lost. Okay. Excellent show, not the best. You're doing good, though. Ooh, Seinfeld is a good one. Still not it. I've seen Seinfeld. Happy Days. Is that in color? Or is that in... Grey's Anatomy is a good one. Not the best. 
Let's make a deal. Friends, the greatest TV show of all time is Lost. Ooh, how many of you have seen Lost? Some of you have seen it. Now, at the beginning of the show, Oceanic Flight 815 crash lands on what seems at first to be a deserted island. As the initial drama of the crash begins to sort out and subside, the survivors begin to tackle their first major decision. Now, there are two schools of thought. One group wants to focus on immediate rescue. They believe their time on the island will not be long. Search groups will be looking for them. They need to be proactive, spelling out help in huge letters with logs on the white sand beaches, building bonfires that can be lit to catch the attention of any aircraft that fly overhead, searching the plane for wreckage for any functional radio equipment to signal for help. They believe their time on the island will be brief, that return is imminent. The second group wants to focus instead on the long haul. They do not believe rescue is imminent. They believe that the group should find clean water and build permanent dwellings and plant sustainable crops, explore the expanse of the island. They believe their time on the island will be long-term, ongoing, indeterminate. Now, both groups want the same thing, to be off the island, to be reunited with friends and family, to return to life as it was before. Their disagreement is on how long it will take, immediate or delayed, days or weeks or months and years, any minute now or off in the far distant future. Jesus' disciples and the early Jesus movement are facing a similar problem. Jesus has a hunch, an intuition, a gut feeling that his life is soon coming to an end. And so gathered around a meal, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what life and ministry and their community should look like in his absence. People who study this section of scripture call it the farewell discourse. It's a phrase meant to summarize Jesus' final instructions to his disciples before his betrayal and arrest and death. We might expect Jesus in this moment to highlight what is most important in his absence. Where the disciples should place their focus. It's like a parent preparing the babysitter for the evening before they leave. Here's what's most important. Dinner is here. The pacifier is here. The emergency contacts are here. The rest is negotiable. Or it's like a spouse preparing their partner before they face a risky surgery. My passwords are here. My will and testament are in the firebox. I love you. Or it's like a coworker preparing to depart for vacation. The files you'll need are here. The appointments are set on the calendar. My auto reply is set. Don't call me. The time for lengthy speeches is over. The moment for detailed instructions has passed. Here are the foundational pieces. I trust your discerning judgment on the rest. And so Jesus begins. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. Okay, do the works that I do. And Jesus continues, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do the works, keep the commandments. Now John knows that it takes a few times of hearing something for it to sink in, and we know that the disciples are a little stubborn. And so Jesus says again, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Now apparently even three times is not enough and Judas presses Jesus and so Jesus repeats again. Those who love me will keep my word. These are Jesus' instructions. The core of his life and ministry and teaching. His time left on earth is short. Here are the cliff notes. Do the work. Keep the commandments. Keep my word. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? 
do the work. Keep the commandments. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Love your God. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't say word one about belief. Believing the right things, proclaiming the correct doctrines, reciting the acceptable prayers or creeds. Do the work, Jesus says. Now this makes us Christian Protestants antsy. It sounds like works righteousness. It's a fancy way of saying you're saved by what you do, earning your salvation, displacing the need for grace or faith. The Protestant reformers pushed back on this practice, saying that we are saved by faith alone. Sola fide, they said. And maybe they pushed back a little too hard because now churches and followers of Jesus seem to spend more time worrying about correct belief than correct practice. The first question anyone asked me when they want to know about my faith or want to know about our church, what do you believe? Never ever is the first question, what do you practice? Or how does your love take form? Or how do you advocate for justice? Or how do you serve your community? And Marcus Borg critiques us Protestants a little, noting how different we are from all the other religions in this regard. Judaism is primarily about practice, following the way of Torah. At the center of Buddhism is practice, following the Eightfold Path. At the center of Muslims is practice following the five pillars of Islam. We Christian Protestants have valued belief over practice, perhaps to a fault. Jesus is preparing his disciples for the interim, the time in between, in between his life and his death, in between his death and his return. For this time in between, Jesus says God will provide another advocate. Jesus was the first advocate he is preparing to be gone, so God will provide another advocate. The disciples will not be left alone. We receive that comforting line, I'll not leave you orphans. God will give you another advocate to be with you. Advocate is a complicated word. It translates a few different ways. It could mean counselor, or comforter, or helper, or mediator. The Spirit does all these things for humanity in Jesus' absence. The Spirit is the one who advocates, speaks on our behalf when our vocabulary falls short and our words stumble across our lips. The Spirit is the one who counsels, nudges, and beckons us into places of goodness and life. The Spirit is the one who comforts, drawing us towards hope in the midst of despair or reassurance in the midst of grief. The Spirit is the one who helps, who mediates, who interprets the mystery of God that we stumble upon on occasion and glimpse dimly from time to time. The Spirit is God's abiding presence in the interim, in the present now. It's funny then that we talk about the Spirit, so little. Do you know where you're most likely to hear this passage from John's Gospel? This reading is a staple for funerals. And we understand why. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. I go and prepare a place for you. I'll not leave you orphaned. Because I live, you also will live. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, Jesus says. If I perform your funeral, your loved ones will likely hear this passage. But I don't think it means what we assume it means. Jesus isn't talking about an afterlife. The many dwelling places, the many rooms are not about the pearly gates and the streets of gold somewhere in the clouds. He's talking about this life. Jesus is offering comfort and instruction to the disciples and followers who will continue to live and serve and do the work of Jesus into the uncertain, uncharted, still unfolding future. Because of Jesus' return to God, we have access to God now. We have relationship with God now. 
We have strength and boldness and assurance and permission to act now. One person writes, Jesus does not give the disciples hope of a distant future in which he will return, but an immediate hope of continuing to know him, even though he is not physically present on earth. In the interim time, Jesus says, do the work, keep the commandments, tell the story, be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, friends, I am not from Missouri, or do you say Missouri? Missouri? Okay. But you probably learned the legend of the Show Me State slogan in your Missouri history classes. I'm learning them now. And as I read this week, the most widely known legend attributes the phrase, the Show Me State, to Missouri's U.S. Congressman William Duncan Van Deaver, who served in the United States House of Representatives from 1897 to 1903. While a member of the U.S. House Committee on Naval Affairs, Van Deaver attended an 1899 naval banquet in Philadelphia. In a speech there, he declared, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs. Now, I had to look up what a cockleburr is. <laughs> Do you all already know what a cockleburr is? Uh, apparently, they don't have those in West Virginia. It's like a prickly, st sticky seed, or is it a plant? Seed, okay. I come from a state that raises corn and cotton and cockleburs and Democrats. And frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me, Van Deaver said. I'm from Missouri. You've got to show me. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me. Now, another version of the legend comes from a mining strike in Colorado in the 1890s. Miners were brought up from Joplin, Missouri, to take the place of striking miners in Colorado. And unfamiliar with northern mining techniques and requiring frequent instructions, the Missouri miners were ridiculed frequently by the pit bosses saying, well, this man is from Missouri. You'll have to show him. Don't tell me what to do. Show me. Now, I think this morning, with your agreement, we could declare Jesus an honorary Missourian. Don't tell me about God, Jesus might say. Show me. Don't offer thoughts and prayers. Offer action and reform. Don't make faith a hobby, a pastime. Make it a lifestyle, a lived experience. Don't dream of an afterlife. Work toward a present life that mirrors the kingdom of God. Now, I bet Jesus could get behind your Missouri State motto. How many of you know the Missouri State motto? Oh, mercy. Salus populi, suprema lex esto, how's your Latin? It means let the welfare of the people be the supreme law. Here's perhaps one small example of what I mean. Last week, a couple approached our church, struggling with physical disabilities, living out of their car. To quote the hymn, they were tired, they were weak, they were warm. They asked what we could do to help. So we invited them in. And they used our showers. It was their first shower in a while. And the man shaved for the first time in a few months. And I smiled and told him he looked 10 years younger. And it was the first time I saw him smile. The woman said, you're the first church that invited us in and offered to help. And we've talked to a lot. We've been judged. We've been turned away. We've been belittled. This church made us feel whole again. All it took was a shower. A little hospitality. And doing the work of Jesus. That work is far from over until people don't have to live in their car. We didn't have to tell them what we believe, at least some at Christian church. We were able in some small way, in some small, small way, to show them. Show me.
Thanks be to God this day.